Hello everyone, and welcome back to our class on the life of David. Today we are in lesson 8, looking at David and Saul once again. We are in 1 Samuel 26 and 27. Here's what's going on in our story. 1 Samuel 26, the, the chapter opens with Saul hearing about the whereabouts of David. And he starts to pursue him again. That brief interlude of taking a break because of David's compassion. David proving that he wasn't interested in killing Saul. Ah, it was only short-lived. And so Saul and his 3,000 chosen men, uh, they go on the search for David in the wilderness of Ziph. It seems really similar to the events back in chapter 24, but there's a few differences here. In verse 3, the location is different, David's location. Here he's in the hill of, of Hakaliah. In verse 4, we see it in, in chapter 24, Saul happened upon the cave that David and his men were hiding in. But here in chapter 26, we see in verse 4 that David's spies told him where Saul is hiding at. And so rather than Saul happening upon the same cave that David is in, here David hears where Saul is at and he goes. And he takes a man to go to where Saul is at, where Saul is camped. And in chapter 24, David goes alone to Katrunk to confront Saul. By himself he goes and he cuts off that piece of his rope. Well, here in chapter 26, David goes with Abishai. Abishai. He is the brother of Joab. And so they approach Saul and something similar between the two chapters. As they approach Saul, it's Abishai who says to David, who asks him in verse 8, who's going to take his life? It says in verse 8 of 1 Samuel chapter 26, it says, Abishai said to David, today God has delivered your enemy into your hand. Now, therefore, please, uh, please let me strike him with a spear to the ground with one stroke. I will not strike him a second time. Here he's saying there, God has given this all into your hand. It's providential, David. Let me strike him. It won't be messy. I won't have to do it twice. <laughs> it's like the language of this. So uh, it's just so funny. I'll, I'll kill him once. It'll be one good clean cut, one good hit. Surely this must be the plan of God. Well, David answers. David reasons with Abishai. And here's what he says. A couple of reasons why he can't kill Saul. Number one, he says, who can stretch his hand against the Lord's anointed without uh, without being guilt and be without guilt? Verse nine. In other words, two wrongs don't make it right here. Uh, murdering someone is still murder. I mean, it, it, you're taking a life. And so two wrongs are not going to make all this go away. It's not going to make, it's not going to be the right way to respond to this. He also says in verse two, he says, surely the Lord will strike him the day will come that he dies. In other words, David had complete faith that God is going to handle the situation, that God will answer Saul. The Lord's justice will come and he'll deal with Saul in his time. And that's kind of the last thing he says in verse 11. He says, Lord forbid that I should stretch my hand against the Lord's anointed. In other words, he, he recognized Saul's position. He recognized the Lord's orders, the order of things. And so he recognized it's not my place. It's not my place to judge Saul. It's not my place to, to take his life. It's not my place to intervene. Yes, I have been wronged. Yes, Saul is in the wrong. No, it's not my job to make it right. It's God's job. And again, there are just, there are so many times that we struggle with this. We talked about this back when we studied chapter 24. It just, it comes back to us again here that we, we struggle sometimes letting God be God. You know, we just, we, we see this played out in our lives so many different ways. Maybe we're like Job. And we try and provide answers for why things have happened, why, why suffering has occurred. We try and give answers for God as if we're trying to explain it away. But the thing is, in the book of Job, God didn't tell Job. God didn't tell him why he suffered. God didn't tell him about the conversation he had with Satan. He, he simply reminded Job that he is God. He is in control. And Job needs to place his faith in him. And sometimes we do that. Rather than letting God be God, we try and fill in the, fill in the blanks. For the questions we have about why things are the way they are, rather than just letting God be God and letting people put their trust in Him. Sometimes we do this with revenge, just seeking justice in our minds. Proverbs 20, verse 22 reminds us, do not say, I will repay evil. No, instead, wait for the Lord. He will, he will save you. It's not our place to bring about vengeance. See, it, it, God is going to answer God will bring about his justice. It may not be in the time we like. It may not be in the way we wish. But it must be left in God's hands. God is just. God is fair. And God will handle. God will answer. God will bring about his justice. 
We just need to wait and trust in him. Well, David and Abishai take Saul's belongings. This is down in verse 13 through 16. And so they take his belongings um, to the top of a mountain at a distance. They take his spear that was by his head and the water jug that was by him as well. So they take it at a large distance with a large area in between them. They're putting some space between, between them and Saul's camp. And then David addresses the camp. David addresses them. The first thing he does is he addresses Abner. Abner is Saul's commander. And essentially his charge is, what's wrong with you? We snuck into your camp and we stole things that were right next to Saul. You're doing a pitiful job. Were we an enemy, we could have killed him. You, you need to be punished for this. You need to step it up, buddy. But then he addresses the king. He's got words to say to Saul. He begins with the question that he has been asking over and over and over again through these chapters. In chapter 19 and verse 5, and chapter 20 and verse 1, chapter 20 and verse 32, chapter 24 and verse 11, he's been asking the question over and over again, why? Why are you pursuing me? What have I done to deserve this? Why are you exhausting all of your resources? Why are you relentlessly coming after me? I mean, what have I done? Tell me, tell me. Because he says in verse 19, if, if, if this is from God, if, if I have sinned against God, tell me. I, I will make it right. I will offer a sacrifice. But if this is just men, if this is just the evil in your heart, if this is from men, cursed are you before the Lord. How dare you if God has not directed you? Because what evil has I, have I done? Because out of Saul's actions... And Saul's actions, David has been driven from the promised land. That glorious land that God promised, David's not been able to enjoy it or live in it. The, the, the land that was promised to the forefathers, this divine inheritance, the land where they could live and serve the Lord. David's feeling like he's being pushed out. There's nowhere he can live. There's nowhere he's safe. By driving them out of the land, David's enemies are denying him that inheritance. And... He pleads in verse 20. I'm looking at verse 20. David says, Do not let my blood fall to the ground away from the presence of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to search for a single flea, just as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. He says, Don't do this. Don't pursue this to my death. He says, Your your goal of trying to kill me is about as fruitful as hunting a partridge in the mountain, something so small and insignificant, meaningless. It's, a, it's an insignificant pursuit, trying to get one bird in the midst of all these mountains, climbing the mountain to kill one bird. And then he ends in verse 23, he says, The Lord will reward each man for his righteousness. God rewards righteous. Psalm Four verse three, Psalm eighteen nine, verses nineteen and twenty says the same thing. So God, God's going to answer us for the way that we've been behaving and living. I mean, you just you got to feel for David. You, if you've been reading these chapters as we as we have been going through them, you just you can't help but feel so miserable for David. In one moment, because he had the faith and courage to stand up to Goliath, he's a hero. He, he delivered God's people. He stood up for the name of the Lord. And because he did the right thing, he's now spent all this time, all this time running, hiding, fleeing. He's putting himself and others who love him in danger. It seems like everywhere he goes, there's a wake of damage. As Saul is relentlessly pursuing him. And it doesn't seem like there's any end. I mean, David is at the end of his rope. And so what happens here in chapter 27, as we're looking at here, chapter 27. Well, one, one thing before we get there, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because Saul admits his foolishness. Verse 21, I have played the fool and have committed a serious error. Well, he admits it. At least he said it with his own mouth. But you notice, verse 21, he asked for David to return and David responds, now let one of the young men come over and take it. In other words, you can come and take this, but I'm not coming back with you. I know you too well. I know you all too well. You can come get your stuff, but I'm not going back with you. I'm not coming back. And so Saul and David part ways, and it had to be that way. This would only continue to, to pursue. This would only continue to go on until one of them died. And David's not about to take Saul's life 
And so chapter 27 and verse 1, it says that David says to himself, Now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape into the land of the Philistines. Saul then will despair of searching for me any more in all the territory of Israel. I will escape from his hand. Hmm. How would you describe that? How would you describe what David is saying there? Well, he's defeated. He, he's absolutely exhausted. Mentally, physically, he is discouraged, negative, pessimistic, pessimistic in his thinking. He's just saying, this is just it. He's going to kill me one day. I'm going to perish by the hand of Saul. See, David was told he's going to be the next king. He was, he was anointed by Samuel. He had received reminders to the voices of Jonathan and Abigail. Even Saul said that. But this day, today, at least on this day, he's convinced it's never going to happen. I'm never going to be king. Saul is going to win eventually. I'm, I'm just going to have to die. He's going to kill me. And so he rationalizes the only thing that I can do is to go the complete opposite direction. I have to go and to live not in Canaan. I have to go and live in the land of the enemy, in the land of the Philistines. And so in verse 3 and verse 4, he, his men, and his family all flee to the land, to the city of Gath. You know what we, comp what we call this? That's a compromise. Compromise is, is an agreement or a settlement of a dispute that's reached by either side making concession. It's accepting standards that are lower than desirable. So to compromise is to make a deal between different parties where each party gives up part of their demand. And so here David seems to compromise, not with Saul. He's compromising on his character. He, he settles in the land of the enemy. He takes his family to go and live there. He, he seeks to hide his identity, gaining the, the enemy's trust through deception. Because while he defeated Israel's enemies in verse 8 and verse 9, he gave the impression that he attacked his own people in verse 10 and verse 11. That's, that's a slippery slope to go down, compromise. We might use words like to justify, to rationalize. Uh, when we compromise on small things, they lead to larger things. Once leads to twice. Once the door is opened, it's hard to close. That's, that's the same kind of thought. We compromise on our morals. If I do it once, it's just one movie, it's just one video, it's just one drink, it's just one time. We compromise on our faith, right? I'm just going to miss one service. I'm just, I'm just taking a break from the Bible for a little bit. I'm, I'm just going to hang out with these people once. If you do it once, the door is open. You've taken that step, and it's hard to go back. David here makes a compromise. Rather than trusting in the Lord and the promise of God that he will be a king and staying in Israel, he flees and he flees to the land of the enemy because he believes he has no answer. He believes there's no there's no way this is going to happen. And so he takes matters into his own hands. Well, let me ask you this. Maybe you can give some answers at home and I'll share some things I have here. If you were given a chance, step into the story here in chapter 27, and you hear David say what he says in chapter 27, verse 1. My life is, is done. Saul's going to kill me. I might as well just go live with the enemy. What would you say to that, David? What words would you say to him? You know, you, you, you might just remind him of the words that he said in the cave. See, David, seek your refuge, not in the, in the camps of, uh, of the enemy. Seek your refuge in the city of God and the shelter of the Lord under his wings. Psalm 57 and verse 1. Don't, don't, don't seek your protection from the enemy. That's going the wrong way. Listen to the words you've said and let God be your protection. Let God be your shield. Don't forget. I think we tell David, don't forget the promise. God promised you you're going to be king. He promised it. Trust in his words. Seek his help. I know you feel low right now. I know things seem bad. But just listen to God's words. God means what he says. You know God keeps his promises. You, you've stood up for God before. Don't let this be any different. Stop and, and, and think about your actions, David. The answer isn't going to go turn your back on God's people and live with the enemy. But remember that the people we choose as our friends and our associates, they'll affect us. Bad company corrupts good morals. There, there's got to be another answer. There's got to be another, another way. In fact, remember, you're not alone. Look all around you. Look at all the people here. Your family here is with you. All these men, they've been running too. They've been fleeing too. 
These men believe in you. Your family is by your side. Your God hasn't given up on you. Don't, don't do this. I know you seem low and I know you seem defeated, but let's, let's slow down. And let's see if we can find another response. Let's spend some time and let's pray to God about it. Let's spend some time and let's, let's just talk about God's promises about it. I think you'll come out with a better conclusion. Do you ever feel like you need to have that conversation with someone? Have you ever felt like you need to have that conversation with yourself? Have you ever felt defeated like David? You, just, you keep trying to do the right thing, and it always seems like it's met with, with resistance, with persecution. It's always met with, with people who just try and stop you from doing the right things, people who make fun of you, you missed out on opportunities. Maybe you just feel like bad news on top of bad news on top of bad news, kind of like David, just one after another after another kind of seems to dogpile. And you think, I'm giving my life to God. I'm praying to God. I'm being faithful to God. Why is all this happening to me? You know, it, it can be easy like David. When you're tired and you're weary and you've been fighting this battle for a long time and it doesn't seem like it's ever going to end, it can be so easy to say, you know what? I've tried. I've tried and I've tried to be faithful, but I can't win this. I can't win it. I might as well just go live with the enemy. Might as well just give up. Might as well just go live like the world. Might as well just live as if there isn't a God. Might as well just give up on the church, give up on Christianity. I'm, I can't win this. I, I've been fighting for so long, and I'm tired. I'm tired of being beat up. I'm tired of being discouraged. I'm tired of people telling me that I'm not any good. I'm tired of, of doing the right thing and then being punished for it. Might as well. Don't let the world be your place where you seek your refuge. Because whatever it is you think you're, whatever comfort, whatever security, whatever safety you think you're going to find in the world, you're going to find through its friends, you're going to find through that bottle or that pill or that medicine, whatever it is. It's not going to give you what you're looking for. You know, have, have you thought about just taking some time away and just looking to the Lord in prayer? Don't forget what he's promised you. Jesus is coming. Heaven is there. Heaven is real. Jesus is always with us. You're not alone. Don't, don't forget what this is all about. Don't forget what's coming. It is going to come. Stop and think for a minute about your actions. Stop and think. Because the answer isn't going to go live with, with the enemy. To go and live like the world. Because remember, bad company corrupts good morals. And if you throw this all away, if you give it up, there's not anything better out there for you. Remember, you're not alone. you got a family of believers. A family in Christ. And they know exactly what you're going through. They've walked the same path and they face the same hardships. And they're still with Christ. They believe in you. And they're here for you and they'll pray for you. In fact, they're probably praying for you right now. And you have your family. And your family in your home. The family that God has given to you. And they will be with you and stand by you and by your side. And don't forget. And everything that you have faced and everything that you're going through, God knows it. God sees it. God's been with you. You're not alone. So don't go live in the land of the enemy. I know it's hard. And I know you're facing a lot. But don't give up. No, let's just take a little time and let's pray together. And let's let's seek God's God's answers. Let's spend a little time and let's open up God's word and let's remember what this is all about. And let's spend some time as a family. And let's just encourage each other and build up each other. And then we're gonna go back and we're gonna do we're gonna find a different solution to some of these problems. You think that make a difference? You think sitting down and having that kind of a conversation would make a difference? Have you ever needed to hear those words? Do you think, is there someone in your life who maybe needs to hear that right now? Be a friend to that person. Just like someone would need to be a friend to David. And help them out of these times. This isn't the end of David's story. No, he's going to go live in the land of the enemy. And as he thinks, he's escaping his problems. What he will come to find is that even in the land of the enemy, his problems will find him there. And so come back and study with us as we find David living in the land of the enemy. 
and how he is able to strengthen himself in the Lord and to make the right choices to come back to the right places. I thank you so much for studying with me. I'd love to hear from you if you have any thoughts or comments. I hope you're doing well. I hope to hear from you or see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.